Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, thank you. Um, my name is David Marini. I'm the program manager of the grad writing program. I would like to introduce uh, a, one of our esteemed faculty members and courageously handsome Tom Barbash. <laughs> Courageously handsome, I love it. It's gonna be a great blurb. Um, uh, so I am, I am Gloria tonight. You know. So how's, how's that? Um, not really. No, nobody can be Gloria except for the wonderful Gloria. Um, but um, it is my honor to um, to kick off this evening of terrific readings of um, with four writers who I've known since since uh, they walked in our doors. Um, and um, I just wanted to say, um, that, you know, there's a lot of, of, of talk uh, in the writing community, especially we all got back from AWP about the worth of an MFA. And the way I've always thought about it is, and I've told our students that it's a gift you give yourself of two years in which the focus is on writing, the conversations are about books and writing, about process, what you're reading and thinking, and the new worlds you're cooking up. And, um, and I'm always amazed at, at CCA, at how far our, our students travel from when they arrive here and become immersed in, in that world and when they reach this point at the end of the second year when they're turning in their second drafts of their book length thesis projects, when they begin to figure out who they are as writers and what their best material is, when they come to this stage and read the work, it's really honed, honed down stuff. This is, this, is, this is stuff they really care about and we're always dazzled and I know we will be tonight. Um, when they understand all the hours they've put in honing their craft, writing and thinking and reading and editing and writing again. I mean, it's great to see their work habits. I always do this speech in the beginning of starting to do three or four hours a day, you know, maybe six days a week, and they always look at me amazed. And then by this time this year, they're doing a lot more than that, and, and it's great. I love to see the little bags under their eyes, you know, at this time. <laughs> so I sort of do. Sorry, guys. But, um, and I'm hoping... Um, uh, so equally important is, is that they find a community here and find a community am among each other. I remember the barbecue this year of, and seeing the second years and kind of introducing them to first years and realizing they were the cool kids now. They were the seniors, you know, and it was sort of a great sight. I think I kidded them about it and I'm not sure they appreciated it. So. Um, but this group is really a tight knit, tightly knit bunch and they've been great guides for our first years. And I'm hoping that a, a lot of them will stay around and help build our not so little corner of the Bay Area literary community. I really want CCA to dominate the, the Bay Area um, uh, literary community. And, I, and, and the more that you guys stick around, um, the better. We as faculty have seen you guys grow from the first meet and greet parties to this exciting time. And we're so proud of how far you've come. So um, anyway, a hand for these guys before we even start. So. I'm going to introduce the, the, our first reader. Okay, so this is uh, an intro that's written by our Patrick Newsom for Evan, Evan Adams. For many writers, there's something special about the nighttime. While the rest of the world sleeps, there's more psychic room available for nocturnal thinkers and workers to inhabit, and Evan Adams is one such writer. Several months ago, I had the opportunity to stay up talking with Evan and we chain smoked cigarettes on my apartment balcony until 3 or 4 a.m. when I, a somewhat more diurnal person, succumbed to the latent exhaustion that accompanies each of us through these past few years, and particularly these months leading up to our thesis presentations. Evan, however, was just catching stride. And if I recall correctly, they were either stitching a map of Seattle's food foraging locations onto a pair of jeans, devouring a novel by Octavia Butler, or plotting the intricacies of a forthcoming fanfic. Likely it was all three, and that was following an extensive, hours-long discussion of gender politics and the inherently problematic existence of a book like the DSM. Evan Adams is a great thinker, an excellent writer. I've had the pleasure of sharing a fiction workshop with him every single term of our graduate career, and I can say for certain that my manuscripts are much more accurate because of it. Evan's attention to detail, continuity, and relevance to the ever-expanding worlds of literature are as infinite as their dedication to the written world. Word. 
From the first day of orientation when I met Evan and probably tarnished myself by making ignorant jokes to these last few weeks, I am glad to have earned a trusted colleague and a loyal friend. Please join me in celebrating the work of Evan Adams. shorter than Tom. Uh, hi, yes, thank you, Pat, and thank you, you know, everyone. Um, and, and seriously, the thing with the other box on the name tag was two years ago. I've gotten over it. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I'm the only one who didn't actually get to hear their introduction before now, so. Um, I wrote recently in Joseph's poetry workshop I dreamt a world and now I'm here. Not, I just mean I'm here. I'm a working class kid from the Central District in Seattle. A lot of the kids on my block growing up never finished high school and I'm about to get a master's degree. And yeah, I worked my ass off and I was also damn lucky, but I had a lot of help too. I wanna to start by thanking all my teachers here. I won't name them all, it's a long list and you'll hear their names many times this evening, but I wanted to particularly thank John Lasky who taught the first class I ever attended at CCA, Emily McVarish, Hugh Bem Steinberg, and Matt Irabarne whose classes provided me with opportunities I wouldn't have had at a lot of other schools. Uh, my mentor during this last semester, Tom Barbash, and my thesis committee, Eric Olson and Joseph Lees. Also, all of my fellow students who have made my time here such an amazing experience especially Pat, who wrote my introduction, was my first friend here, my partner Will, and the second years last year who made an exceptional effort to make sure that my year felt like we were coming into a strong, welcoming community. Jenny, Julie, Alicia, Tonica, Sam Smeat, and Pat Van Neville, thank you. Um, and I have to thank my family for all of their help. You have no idea how much it means to me to have been here with all of you. It's been a privilege. So I'm going to read an excerpt from my novel. It's about a gender fluid, polyamorous 16 year old. And what you need to know for this section um, is that they're with their girlfriend Seal at a Yule party um, at Rainbow House, which is a large poly pagan household near Seattle. Um, and they've just stolen some drugs from one of the bathrooms, uh, taken some tramadol, um, and then they had an argument with Seal and a large glass of wine on top of the Percocet they took earlier in the day. Now, um, <laughs> Now they're starting decorating the Yule tree and Florida, who's one of the adults at Rainbow House, is explaining how that works. You come up to the tree and say your name if you want to and talk a little bit about your ornament, what it symbolizes, why it matters to you, anything you think is important. If you just got one from the box upstairs, then talk about why that one, what about it spoke to you. There are no right or wrong answers, just say what you feel. Then you tell us one thing you learned in the past year, and one thing that you made better, or put another way, a situation, or you know, a place, or even a person where you made a lasting positive difference. Then you get to choose the next person to go. There was one spot left on the couch, and I darted over to it. Seal, as she usually did, sat on the floor in front of me, leaning against my legs. I reached down to take my shoes off, but apparently I'd already done so. Looking around with some concern, I saw them mixed in with a great number of others around the door. I must have removed them almost as soon as we'd come in. Weird. So as most of you already know, I'm Florida. I live here at Rainbow House. I'm Jonathan's wife and Rowan's girlfriend and the mother of Fern, Clover, Sage, and Chamomile, an adoptive second mother of Rowan's son. Although I think those of you who know me would agree I tend to act like a second mother to just about everyone. I was having more trouble than was in any way reasonable getting the ribbon threaded through the loop on my ornament. It was hard to get my eyes and my hands to both stay on task long enough to get it done. Just a cup of wine shouldn't have messed up my coordination this much. I didn't feel heavy exactly, just a strong disinclination to move, only exacerbated by the frustration of making four unsuccessful attempts at doing an extremely basic physical task. I wanted to set the stupid thing down, lean back, let my eyes go out of focus, to sit very still and pay attention to the strange but not unpleasant spinny, floaty feeling that seemed to mostly be located in my head and the texture of the soft blanket covering the couch and the deep, uncomplicated physical euphoria that, while it wasn't enhanced by the alcohol, or as far as I could tell by the Ultram, still made its presence felt quite clearly through their effects. This ornament is shaped like a cedar waxwing, Florida told us. 
She might have been right, but I had no way of knowing. It looked vaguely like a cardinal to me, but smaller and not bright red. They're some of my favorite birds because you see them in winter. Not here, but back in St. Paul, where I'm from. They're out in winter in the snow, and they're so pretty and so happy looking, and they just find all of these beautiful looking red berries, and so, to me, they symbolize finding the small, beautiful things in hard times and barren places. I realized, belatedly, and with a little surge of panic that sort of formed and dissipated without bubbling up the way it normally would, that I'd mixed alcohol with at least one opiate, and that was something one was not supposed to do. But the main reason why not was respiratory depression. I didn't seem to be in any immediate danger of losing consciousness. As long as I stayed awake, I could remember to breathe, even if it felt like more of an unpleasant chore than it usually did. Something I learned this year that I had to learn, much as I didn't want to, is to respect my own limitations. As some of you already know, I've been dealing with a number of health problems in the past year, and it's been hard to learn how to take it easy, set a pace for myself that I can stick to, and let slide the things that don't really matter. Wonder what that's like, I said to Seal under my breath. She looked at me sharply like I'd interrupted something she was really into. Weird. I took advantage of having her attention to hand my or her my ornament and the ribbon. Hey, can you thread this through for me? I'm having <clears throat> trouble with it for some reason. Uh, sure. Seal took them from me and got the ribbon looped through, then tied the ends in a knot like they were a single thread. Here. Thanks. As for what I've improved, Florida went on. One of the wonderful side effects of having to stop working almost completely is that I've been able to devote a lot more of what energy I do have to taking care of my family and making Rainbow House the best possible home for the people who live and visit here. There were actually scattered applause as she hung her ornament on the tree. She pointed at Clover, who got up with a tiny spiky ornament held carefully in her hand like it was a living butterfly or something. Um, my ornament is, I don't know, how many of you can see it? I can't, I said, but it came out indistinct and quieter than I meant it to. Fortunately, several other people said they couldn't either. Well, it's a tiny origami crane. This is actually, I made a pair of these as earrings for myself, and I made another one for my sister's, sorry, my brother's girlfriend for midwinter, but it turns out she only has one ear piercing, so that's not the thing I learned, I promise. Anyway, it's a tiny little crane, and it's made out of rainbow paper because... I stopped listening at that point because I knew where she was going with it and it was too insipid to say out loud. Or it should have been. She was saying it out loud, so too hard to listen to anyway. Hard, bad, insipid. Too insipid to listen to. I closed my eyes and the amount of spinniness went from kind of fun to holy crap. It could have been interesting if I were in a situation where I didn't have to pretend to be not on drugs so, so that breathing faster and holding on tight to the couch and getting my brain to stop fighting the sensation of movement were options. But since they weren't and I was starting to feel nauseated, I opened my eyes. That was hard and I didn't like it at all. The nausea ebbed but didn't disappear, but I'm nothing if not good at suppressing nausea. Okay. I needed something to do with my hands so that I could stay moving a little, have something to focus on, a reason to keep my eyes open and not drift into the dark, soft thing that seemed to be waiting in the back of my head. If I'd had my knitting, or better yet, a beading project, but I didn't, and there wasn't really room for all the little things of little beads on the couch anyway, and I didn't have it. What did I have? I started checking pockets, firmly telling the impulse to see what adding a propranolol to this mix would do to go sit in a corner, at least for tonight. Coins, bus pass, hair ties. Why did I even have hair ties? Okay, hair ties. I started working my fingers through Seal's hair, getting out the loose tangles that had already started to form, even though she'd brushed on the bus a few hours ago. She turned around to look at me, and I tilted my head to the side, which made everything really confusing for a second. She nodded once, apparently as intent on what Clover was saying as she had been on what Florida was. I spent longer than I needed to combing out her hair. Unruly though it was, it was also soft, and soft things go with opiates like caramel sauce with good chocolate ice cream. When, I was, when it was starting to stick up more rather than smooth down, I gathered half her hair and started braiding it, fighting down waves of nausea as I did. I was starting to feel sort of poisoned the way I sometimes did after a night of unusually heavy drinking and not enough sleep. It was harder than it should have been. I kept dropping sections or losing focus and putting them in the wrong order. So when someone, Fern, said my name, I was still only halfway done. The nausea got a lot worse very suddenly when I stood up. I took a couple of deep breaths, which didn't really help, and tried to get from my seat to the tree without tripping over any obstacles, like the floor. I giggled and put a hand on the tree to steady myself, realized it was too bendy, and moved back a little so I could use the wall. 
ornaments. I didn't have it. Um, I said, I don't have a seal. Can you? I made a gesture like picking up something small. She got up and brought me the little glass globe without apparent difficulty. Thanks, I whispered, tangling the ribbon in my fingers so I wouldn't drop it. So, I said, um, I'm Carson. Some of you, Clover and Ellie slash Eli, although I guess neither of them is really here, and Brooke and Morgana and Quark probably know me as Loki. So, this is a little glass ball. It was handmade by a friend of mine a while ago, and it's blue with red and lavender, which obviously it occurs to me, you know, you, you can see because you can see it, unless you're colorblind. Anyway, you know, red's a feelingsy color, and lavender's awareness and stuff, mostly psychic, but in other ways, and blue is both, so, I mean, I squinched my eyes shut and shook my head trying to clear it. Yeah, bad idea. Let me elaborate on that. Loki, said Morgana, you might want to speak up a little. What? Oh, yeah, sure, sorry. I suspected the problem was indistinct more than quiet, but I tried to speak a little louder as well as enunciating better. And this segues neatly into my thing that I learned, so I'm just going to go ahead and do that. I hadn't thought at all about what I was going to say, but I was starting to get a sense of it. If you sort of put those things together, you get, like, awareness of feelings, basically. And that's something I've been thinking a lot about, and I guess working on this past year. Figuring out what's actually going on with me, what I want, and thingy, feel, rather than, you know, I'm a writer, sort of. I write, so I tend to think in stories, and so thinking in terms of what I feel or whatever, rather than what I should be feeling according to the narrative in my head. And one of the big things that I found out with paying attention to that is that I like having boobs. Sorry, that didn't, I mean, I do, but... Let me try that again. I identify as more gender fluid rather than just as a guy, and part of that is that having a female body is just fun, even if it still makes my skin crawl sometimes. I can do things with it that, and IDK, sometimes it doesn't make me want to, I made a vague gesture, with a vegetable peeler, so yeah. So that's what I learned. I glanced around the room slowly so my brain could keep up with my eyes. It didn't look like anyone was staring at me with a horrified expression, but I wasn't sure. Sorry about the vegetable peeler, that was unnecessary. Anyway, something I helped make better is my little sister, Sif. I've been doing a lot of her homeschooling most Fridays or Saturdays when I can't, like today, for Oc Ed credit. And I mean, yeah, I'm getting school credit for it, but I'm also, you know, I'm contributing to my family in a grown-up kind of way, and that's nifty. And I think I'm helping her learn stuff, maybe stuff that she wouldn't if it were just the parents, even if some people continue to insist that there's such a thing as too young to start learning psychopharmacology. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm done. No one clapped, but I was pretty sure they hadn't clapped for Fern or Clover either, so that was okay. I hung the ornament on the first branch I could reach, started down the stairs, stopped, came back up, pointed to seal, then went down to the kitchen as quickly as I could without giving the appearance of rushing or falling down. Um, and I am reading... <laughs> I'm reading Summer's Introduction, which was written by our very own Nelson Rivera. Remember the name Summer Harim Park. Summer is going to make it. In these last few semesters in the writing program, I've had the pleasure of sharing quite a few classes with Summer. You know how when you pick a seat on the first day in a workshop or a seminar, you sort of stick with that seat for the rest of the semester? Well, it worked out that Summer and I kept sitting next to each other semester after semester after semester. I've been able to listen to her writing grow and amaze me week after week. This is why I say, Summer is going to make it. Her story is inspiring. Before she came here to the United States, she had a government job in Korea. She decided one day that what she had to say needed to be on the page, and so she found herself here at CCA pursuing a dream, chasing a passion. Granted, not everyone has the chance to be here, but for those that do, it takes a lot more than a dream to thrive once you're here. In Summer, I see the hallmarks of any great writer. First, she has the skill. Her writing is elegant yet punchy. Her language walks across the page with grace and flair. She has dedication. In her writing, her characters come to life in a way that only comes from a thoughtful writer who's put in real time. And perhaps most importantly, she is brave. Hers is the willingness to be daring. 
Summer's writing is writing that truly lets itself go there. It's the same impulse that's attracted Summer to, by her own initiative, enroll in salsa dancing classes and circus arts courses. Often soft-spoken but never shy, Summer is a quiet force. So while we congratulate Summer on her achievement thus far, let's also congratulate ourselves for being here at the beginning of Summer's long and productive future. Thank you, Nelson. Trying to make me cry before my reading. <laughs> Not cool. <laughs> um, on my first day here, uh, orientation day, we had pizza with Eric Olson. And he said, we should work really hard so that in the end, we can look back and say, wow, I can't believe I fucking did that. <laughs> Those were his very words. <laughs> um, and that pretty much sums up how I feel right now, but I couldn't have done it by myself. So I would like to thank John, Amy, Tom, Anita, Gloria, Anne, John, Tom, Rebecca, Eric, Al, Donna, Anita, Rebecca, and John. <laughs> Did I say John? Um, I said some names more than once because I love them so much that I ended up working with them more than once. Um, and, I said the, and I said only the first names because in Korea it is unimaginable to address your professor by first names only. And I was very touched here that I was allowed to call them by first names and feel like they're my friends as well as teachers. <laughs> and David, well, just thank you. <laughs> I'd also like to thank my fellow class of 15. I feel very lucky to be in the same batch with you guys. And thank you class of 14, who were second years when I was first year. You were nothing but warm and welcoming. And thank you class of 16, you guys are just delightful. <laughs> uh, lastly, I'd like to thank my roommate slash neighbor slash adopted San Francisco family, Fede, Zhu, Pranavi, and Christian, who came out tonight. Um, <laughs> you have kept me alive and kept me happy. Thank you. If I start crying, just blame Nelson. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to read parts from my novel. It's called Welcome to 409, which involves a Korean exchange student and a Chinese ghost who is from 19th century San Francisco. I will read the very first paragraph of the novel to get you started. The tiny room looked clean but smelled dusty. A faint smell of something unpleasantly sweet made Mia wrinkle her nose as she looked around, with only her head inside the doorway. Mia pushed the door further in and dragged in her luggage. The heavy door pushed back at Mia, as if protesting against her entrance. She pushed harder, almost slamming the door to the wall, and commanded, I will be your master now. Obey. The door squeaked eerily as it closed behind her. Um, now, this is where Lotus, the ghost, is attempting to talk to Mia for the first time. Lotus is invisible to the human eye, so she's been in the same room with Mia watching her, but Mia has no idea. After lathering on a few layers of this and that facial cream, Mia threw herself to the bed and stared up at the ceiling. She's too tired to get upset, Lotus thought, as she moved closer to Mia. Hello. Mia jumped up at once with surprising energy and checked herself in the mirror. She quickly opened her pouch and picked up a bottle with brown liquid inside. Squirting some of the liquid onto the back of her left hand, she mixed the liquid with a large brush, with which she stroked her face skillfully. She didn't take her eyes off from the mirror as she called out, Who is it? It's Lotus, Lotus answered, 
Stroke by stroke, Mia's skin was turning a shade lighter. Who? Mia went on to a smaller brush, defining her eyebrows with sharp, quick movements. Lotus. Mia frowned. Her fresh-drawn eyebrows came together. Hold on a second, Mia shouted at the door as she used her fingers to put pink eyeshadows on the eyelids. Ah, uh, OK, Lotus answered, standing a little further behind Mia's back. After frantically curling her eyelashes upwards and brushing them black, Mia went to the door and put her eyes on the peeping hole. Seeing no one, Mia opened the door and stuck her head out to the hallway. <clears throat> I'm here, actually, behind you, in the room, Lotus said awkwardly. Mia turned and let go of the door, which creaked closed. Flinching at the noise, she turned her head from side to side, looking for Lotus. Please don't faint, please don't faint, please don't faint, Lotus trembled. People who moved into 409 always left as soon as Lotus started talking to them. That man who thought her voice was coming from inside his own head and had broken the windows out of frustration. The one who quietly ignored her attempts at conversations and just as quietly left a few days later. The one who fainted, got carried away, and never came back. The one who wept in terror for a whole day before moving out the next day. Hello, my name is Lotus. You can't see me because I'm a ghost. Lotus wished there was a better introduction, something that would ease the humans into the concept. Mia stood frozen, head tilted in an uncomfortable looking angle. Only her eyes kept busy, nervously going through each corner of the room. You can hear me though, right? It was a stupid question, but Lotus wanted to hear Mia respond. Mia didn't move, didn't breathe. Even her eyes stared steadily now into blank space in front of her. Right? Mia's clenched hands behind her back told Lotus that the poor girl was scared, but she couldn't help pushing. Right? Mia jumped with a gasp. Yes, I can. Okay, finally, um, I would like to take you to Lotus's past. Her childhood name was Trunner. She married a man named Hong Lei, who brought her with him from China to San Francisco. They've just landed and arrived in Chinatown. Everyone in this scene is Chinese. Naked girls. They stood or crouched in the corners of the basement. Some had scars, some had boils on their backs. One or two were holding small bundles. Babies, judging by the way they held them preciously with both arms. Some women were fully clothed, sitting on stools at the center of the room, heavy makeup disfiguring their faces. Men sat on stools too, talking and swearing at each other. Trona thought of her father and her uncles. Hong Lei brought her to the back of the room and lifted his jacket from her. Take off your clothes, he demanded, and added as a second thought, leave the necklace I gave you, but take off your clothes. Her large eyes and dumbstruck face did not make him laugh the way it had after he kissed her for the first time. Hurry up, or I'll do it for you, his cold eyes shone in the dark. The obedience she had been practicing for 15 years automatically kicked in, and she started unbuttoning her thin jacket without thinking clearly what was going on. His voice was too authoritative, too scary. Someone announced the beginning of the auction, and people took to their seats, the girls going up to the small podium one by one. Hong Lei looked on the stage and smirked. We are going last. You'll be sensational. You just watch. He helped her take off the last of her undershirt and examined her with a frown. You've lost a little weight. I told you to eat more. Trona remembered the little snacks and treats he procured mysteriously on the ship. She had gladly shared them with the little girls in the cabin. The memory of their sweet journey on the ship bolstered some courage in her. Why are you doing this? she asked. I'm your husband. I will do as I wish. His curt answer cut into her, and her heart sank to the pit of her stomach. But, husband, please, has she done something wrong? She had yet to start serving him earnestly as a good wife. 
Do not cry, it will ruin your face. Hong Lei's low, threatening voice sounded nothing like his sweet whispers that she was used to. Troner bit her lips and breathed through her nose, wiping the few drops of tears that started rolling down her cheeks. I'll be good, I promise I'll be good to you, she hiccuped and sniffed, and her plead was rather incomprehensible. A few people in the audience turned around to look at them. It was more to warn them to be quiet than curiosity. They had seen this sort of scenes too many times before. Hong Lei's eyes now had anger in them. What did I say about crying? But shut it. I don't want to get you up there with bruises and cuts like the other girls. Hong Lei gently put his hand on her left cheek. She felt the firmness concealed behind the soft touch, however, and imagined his full force on her face. Shuddering, Trunner swallowed hard. Is there a 600? No? Then sold at 550 to Ame. The announcer standing next to the podium boomed, and a plum lady in her 30s stood up from the stool to collect her new girl. By the time it was her turn, Trunner had stopped crying and stood stoically on the podium. Ladies and gentlemen, Hong Lei lowered his voice for attention. I bring you a special treat tonight. His mischievous grin was back on his face, but it was not for Trunner. 1100 is where we shall begin. The crowd gasped, scoffed, laughed, swore at Hong Lei's audacity. But I promise you every penny's worth. Hear me out here. First of all, I handpicked this girl and brought her all the way from the inland. That's right, this one is not from Taishan. She is not like those girls tainted by the foreign sailors and merchants. How can we know? For all we know, you bought her off from some brothel at the Sierra Mountains. A beefy man raised his voice. That's not possible. I know every whore in that region and I've never seen her. Another voice shouted from the back of the whole room, uh, from the back and the whole room erupted with the laughter. Now, now, it's not hard to prove that. Trunner, say your name and your age. And where's your home? Hong Lei cooed at her. My name is Trunner. I am 15 years old. I am from Yangjiang. And she can say that in English, too, Hong Lei grinned. Some still complained that her inland dialect could be fake, but Hong Lei ignored them and moved on with his sales pitch. And just look at her, such flawless skin, such lush hips. She is not like the scrawny girls that were shipped here in dozens, sickly and feeble like dying praying mantis. I personally saw to her nourishment and health. He grabbed Trunner's arm and made her turn around. One of the girls who were sold before Trunner went into a coughing fit, as if to prove Honglei's point. The man who bought her crossed his arms and glared at the woman who sold her. Just look at her. And she has full set of teeth. Honglei turned Trunner back around and parted her lips with his hands and proudly displayed for all to see. I'm telling you, she is a phoenix among chickens. No one can compare. Trunner realized all the other girls were allowed to put their clothes back on, and she was the only naked person in the whole room. The glaring lamplight felt warm on her, but still, she couldn't help but shiver under the attention. 1150, someone called. The audience went quiet for a minute, and a couple of others tentatively called out, 1200, and then 1300. Hong Lei took off one of Trunner's shoes and raised it high into the air, showing off the perfect three-inch bound feet. 1,350, 1,400. The numbers stopped moving at 1,500. It was already too much. One might pay such fri price for an already well-known girl, famous for her skills in music or dancing, but it was a record for a fresh-faced new girl. No one? Then the announcer stood up to finalize the sale. Wait, wait, Hong Lei laughed. You haven't heard the most important part. Yes, she is a beauty, but please, gentlemen, don't be so hasty. He leisurely walked around Trunner, teasing his audience. Hong Lei traced his finger down her spine, but she couldn't feel the weight of his hand. A strange feeling that she was slipping out of herself and watching the whole scene unfold left her unmovable. You wouldn't want to buy something without knowing its full potential, would you? 
What you really should know is that this lovely girl here is a virgin. A momentary silence, a few jests and doubts, Hongley's assurance that he saw to it himself, laughter here and there later. The price started going up again, 1550, 1650, 2000, a low raspy woman's voice rang out. In the silence that followed, the announcer finalized the sale. A short while later, a tall and slender lady in green silk dress and light blue trousers came forward. Her hair was neatly pulled into a bun, which created a stark contrast with the rest of the female heads in the room. Most of the girls had a messy residue of what used to be a bun after being shoved around by their owners, old and new. Trunner's hair was relatively neat. It had been braided down at Hongley's request this morning. He wanted her to look young, she realized now. Hold your hands up, girl, the lady in green demanded. Trunner uncertainly looked at Hongley, and only after he nodded did she held out her hands. The lady put a carefully wrapped bundle on Trunner's hands. Hard edges of gold pieces poked at the palm with heavy weight. Tears threatened to pull in Trunner's eyes, and she bit her lips until she could feel them bleeding. The bitter iron taste filled her mouth and cleared her head. Hongle didn't see her face. His eyes were only fixed on the sack. Great, he said, as he relieved Trunner of it and opened it. The gold inside jingled merrily as he shook it slightly to see that it was filled to the bottom. He weighed the sack on the scale next to the podium and confirmed that indeed he had received his fair price. The money has passed through the girl's hands and now the transaction is done. The lady announced formally and gave Truner permission to put her clothes back on. Hongle disappeared into the crowd without looking back. Thank you. Um, next up is Katie, and her intro was written by Charlie Radka. Katie is one of those people that you only run into once in a lifetime. She happened to be one of my first friends in San Francisco and truly embodies what I love about Northern California, the free-spiritedness, the excitement, and fullness of life. Most of you know that her talents are admirable and often surprising. But I can tell you that above all, they are motivated by a heart of incredible size. It's precisely this that makes her just as comfortable volunteering at the Humane Society as she is teaching dance to children or working at the corners. To quote her directly, I'm fine with kids and dead people. It's just everyone in between that freaks me out. <laughs> It's this odd humor, this appreciation for what so often goes unappreciated in life that makes her such a dear friend. So often, I find myself wondering what it would be like to see the world through her looking glass. Thankfully, though, she's provided us with an abundance of her darkly poetic and impossibly funny writing that lets us peer into her world. So here's to my friend and fellow writer, one of the wildest and bravest souls I know. And if I know anything thus far about good writing, dear God, let it be wild and let it be brave. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Katie Jackson. So um, I'll start with some thank yous. I didn't write anything formally. I just scribbled everybody's name down so I don't forget anybody. Um, my thesis committee, Eric, thanks for letting me stay weird. Tom, you've kept me grounded. Um, my mentors, Denise, Gloria, Steve, uh, currently Joseph, and my other Teachers that have dealt with me, helped me, everything. Uh, Lasky, Claire, Kevin, Hugh, 
Shanti, Matt, and uh, the late Anne Marino. And then, of course, David for holding it down at the studio. And Amy, she was the one that called me and let me come here. <laughs> so, um, and of course, all my writers, fellow writers, friends, and my, um, my mom and dad who are here. And my dad has never really heard anything I write, so <laughs> should be interesting. <laughs> um, I'm going to read a couple different things, just two parts uh, from my novel, two different time periods. I'm not going to try to explain it because I'm still figuring that out myself. So the first one's called uh, The Skin He's In. Satan is elegant and we are graceful. Feelings unfilmed and what I recall as a dream, one I'm still in. Money was bleeding when my father stopped breathing. He had taken a walk through Ike's White House. Deadpan faces lined the house of death. I felt the hands and slipped away, tripping over umbrellas and polished shoes. When I lost my balance, everything illuminated as voices afar repeated my name. My sister's speckled eyes were brimmed. I smelled my mother's scotch breath through her coffee lips. It was 9 a.m. White lilies gasped for air as I drifted back to that sad place of childhood. The corpse lay in the box, arms rested on his chest, hands neatly folded. Thick lines cut across his forehead. A crisp panky emerged from his top coat and light reflected on diamond cufflinks. Tailored stitches and kangaroo skin shoes. Jewels shining like marzipan across his deformed arthritic knuckles. No one talked to me. The only people I knew were my sister and mom. I knew that dead man and I wished I did not. I called that dead man father. Never dad, always father. Half with half-witted concern, some pity, and maybe a little empathy, people repeated the same tired slogan. I'm sorry for your loss. Do any of them really give a fuck? With my prepubescent body hidden under the itchy threads, I looked queer and had every desire to miss such a show. Everything ran smoothly to the point where I believed my father was still orchestrating our life after he was gone, and maybe that's why mom was sad. Maybe she was sad because his power crossed the floating boundaries of death. In fact, he probably had an entire symphony planned using our bodies as instruments. I imagined copper wire binding our feet while we dangled like Angus in a slaughterhouse. Our throats would be slit open for blood drain. My corpse, I'm sorry, <laughs> it gets better. Um, my corpse would transform into a cello with a metal rod shoved through my spine to serve as the pin. A crooked knife would carve the shape of an oval around my navel. My intestines would unravel and pile. To hollow my insides, he would sift his hands through the human meatloaf and fetch the gelatinous clump that used to pump blood. Constructing the four strings would require the removal of tendons that connected my tongue, a quick snip to leave it limp. Tendons would be stretched and sewn vertically to connect the oval gap. By this point, Sonia's eyes would have popped out from the side of me, the tenderloin cello. An ax heaved through her middle would splinter the bones inside. A metal cast would encase her body, flesh seared by a blowtorch. For the appropriate pitch of a human symbol, both sides would be hammered out to force any remaining tissue from the damaged meat. A human symphony, this was the vision. My mom shook me awake before the instruments played. While I stared at the mess of blue veins drawn tight across her neck, I envisioned her being asphyxiated and turning entirely blue. Her instrument would be the most unique. Scalding, liquefied silver would run over her foaming head. She would glisten as the wooden bars were attached precisely with the mallet. Flesh punctured and wand in hand, the conductor's corpse xylophone would complete the orchestra. A horribly familiar melody made my ears burn, and I looked up to see my mom's eyes darting amongst the sea of women. Tiny tits, long legs, and sunken eyes decorated the front of the room where my father slept forever. Words were spoken by stilts of black silk, but I could only hear an awful tune, a sound that pierced my ears and made my toes overlap. 
The skin between my toes broke from overgrown toenails and the blood saturated my socks. The eulogies ended with a hum. The caravan followed the carcass to its place of sleep. Gorgeous day. Cloud bundles smeared across the sky, pregnant with precipitation. I looked through the water-spotted window to see the drops race. Branches quivered. I hoped for more wind or quicksand. The land held soft baby schools leaking brain fluid through the maple leaves. Human waste festered in the bark, and I imagined quicksand swallowing the entire mourning family. An aborted fetus would miss the mess, and that's how traditions die. I didn't see one teardrop, only raindrops and a man out of place behind the trees. I would have rather been in a tree. Barrels of whiskey filled the rest of the day. The wines from fermented grapes bloated their bellies and flasked brain chests. Sausages from the steaming platters carried moldy cheeses and other sickly delicacies. Everything was wrong. I didn't know. Um, and then we're going to jump in time to that character as an adult <laughs> working at a um, medical facility. It's called Jokester. Mascara streamed down her face. She had freckles under her eyes and over her nose, which she hadn't grown into. Her lips were split and white in each corner. The cloth was soiled and she was crouched over, holding her abdomen. Two nurses wrestled her onto a gurney and carted her through the left wing of Armour Trauma Center. She screamed and choked on her mucus as they strapped her arms down. The girl had been holding herself in the fetal position, and when they moved her, the blood flushed out. She shook and attempted to contort herself back into that position. Virginia watched them peel her sticky hair out of her mouth as the girl violently twisted her head from side to side, then hyperventilated. One nurse reassured her it'd be all right and gave her breathing instructions, while the other one mouthed something to the doctor over her shoulder. The doctor motioned to one of the desk ladies for a memo pad. His scribbles resulted in a nod and a receiver click. The way the girl squirmed, shaking loose blood clots made Virginia shudder. Her dress was soiled, her skin was pallid and sweaty. Virginia overheard the nurse say the girl was the mayor's daughter, his only child. She should have been sent directly to armor, but she didn't tell him she was pregnant. Instead, she had gone to a friend of her boyfriend the boyfriend who was unknown to the family. Her botched abortion was performed in an abandoned house with the doctor using a medical student's textbook. He had no access to surgical instruments and had improvised with an umbrella spoke that perforated her uterus. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> the girl howled when the nurse injected the anesthesia. Her knees were weak, but her eyes were strong. She flinched and her facial muscles clenched, then went slack. There was a pathetic promise ring on her left hand, only visible when her fingers uncoiled. A nurse strokes her forehead like a mother would do for a hysterical, tired child. She tucked the girl's hair behind her ear on one side and wiped the crusted mascara off her face. She placed the girl's hands on top of one another. A white sterilized sheet draped over her body and a single fold left just her head exposed. The girl went from screaming in excruciating agony to unearthly silence. Sepsis had infected her bloodstream and the tissue lining her abdominal cavity. It was the kicking cramps from blood loss that had conquered her fight before she arrived at armor. This was just a girl, just a terrified girl who had attempted to fix something. Without the political influence of the girl's father, she would have died alone and bloody. Instead, she died in a room full of people and her shortened life was acknowledged, but her death never was. A red alert was issued to Cayetano, which required his presence for the next of kin. He personally escorted the mayor through the guard station in one of the many unmarked black town cars. The corkscrew road stretched over a mile and allowed the staff adequate time for papers to be shuffled, maintenance to clean up, alerts to go out to interagencies, and nurses to do their checks. The commotion of a blanket of death was unnerving to Virginia, and she stayed out of the way. The girl was gone, but her body remained. The mayor was shuffled inside.
His wife was left to wait in the car. He was short with a broom and mustache and a distinctive dimple on the right side of his face. His bluish gray suit matched the top of his hair and his colorless eyes. Sweat stained his forearms and he pinched his chin while he attempted to remain conscious himself. He was led into the operating room. There was a shrill echo in the corridors, followed by a banging of steel and the ting of a thousand instruments hitting the floor simultaneously. Cayetano sent Hunter in to calm the mayor's hysteria. After a long half hour, the mayor emerged, head down, seeing nothing. The mother was not brought in until the mayor allowed it. She stayed somber and held her husband's hand as she viewed her daughter's corpse. Virginia tried to speak to Cayetano, but he brushed her away and told her to return to the opposite corridor until further direction. The transition room for the family was Grandoise, Grandoise with cherry wood banisters wrapping down to jade colored marble which glistened with gold flecks. The vaulted ceilings allowed the natural light to pour over the basin of lilies and 17th century tulips. An active koi pond and the shape of a caduceus created a serene atmosphere and the moving water was soothing to those who visited. It had an octagon floor plan that allowed separate rooms to branch off and patients would be placed in the rooms in accordance to their recovery. There was no autopsy, but she had to be rinsed and disinfected before the practitioner could embalm her. Germicidal solutions were pungent and stung the nose hairs when they were applied. For Virginia, the ammonia was associated with cold bodies. She saw the entire process from the viewing room where Cayetano usually sat. The doctor elevated the girl's head and peeked into her eyes for clouds. He then rolled her onto her side to check for lividity and saw meshed patches of fuchsia and maroon. Her only jewelry was the ring, which was removed and inventoried. He bent, flexed, and massaged her arms for rigor relief. There was air between her joints that caused them to pop and crack when he moved them. Her face was set when the suture was made. The calm face was set for the living. He inserted the tube into her right jugular and a steel cylinder extracted her blood and interstitial fluids. She had to have multiple point injection due to her lack of circulation and the second withdrawal was done with a main artery in her forearm. Her abdomen, which she had white knuckled prior to death, was sliced above the navel. The tissue layers oozed out of place and the aspirator was inserted to hollow out her middle and a syringe filled with the combination of the solvents formaldehyde and ethanol emptied into the cavity. Another suture was used to close the navel incision and then she had her last shower. She was groomed the next day. The mortician used a massage cream on her face to make her skin supple. The makeup was set as natural and her hair was in pinged curls. Her mother brought a suede burgundy Valentino dress with a collar and it matched her sealed lips. The corpse rested in the room with mirrored shelves. Immediate family had a private viewing armor before she was transported. The unknown boyfriend was never seen. It wasn't until the following weeks that Virginia understood the scope of the girl's death. Speculation of what had happened to her was dismissed with the doctor's account of having treated her for reoccurring pneumonia. It was a tragedy that could not be prevented, he said. Every news article contained the same story with a photograph of the girl dressed in her Catholic school uniform and an extensive backstory to describe the mayor and his, and, I'm sorry, how the mayor and his family were moving forward. The mayor used the death of his daughter to plunge into another health debacle. His campaign was spotted with health waivers and declarations for untreated medical problems. Cayetano was on one of his panels for the formulation of support groups for families who lost children to natural causes. Virginia saved every article and marked every appearance that the mayor had made with Cayetano or their collaboration. That month alone, investments made by Armour on the stock exchange increased three shares for the surgical instrument company they went through. This gave incentives and with the mayor's recommendation, the Armour Board passed another investor through the doors. Okay, that's it. Um,
You guys didn't eat yet, right? Sorry, I should have like, warned you. Um, next is Zach. What a space for right? Zach. Um, and Pat Newson, our friend and fellow writer, did his intro. So I'm going to read it. Zach and I live in the same neighborhood in Oakland, and I often see him working at the cafes around there, headphones up, head down, writing in his composition books with absolute dedication. I find it very inspiring. So I'll sit down across from him or the table next to him, and we'll work together for a while, until I usually can't focus any longer, get anxious, or dip out for a smoke, or basically seek any distraction available and latch onto it. Probably because Zach is so focused, so fast, so furious, <laughs> and I <laughs> see him moving forward physically, page by page. I get a little jealous or intimidated because I've been sitting there across from him, idly staring out the window or coming up with something to bug him about. That I've gotten like half a sentence in my own notebook and I've crossed it out just in case. <laughs> Zach and I have read a lot of each other's work and I'm sure that my sentences are stronger after he's looked at them. Either they're gone because he's thankfully dampened my manuscripts with ink or I figure they must be all right because he didn't. So thank you, Zach, for all the work you've put in on my behalf. Your efforts have helped make all of us stronger writers and the sort of support and affirmation you provide with our letters is integral to the success of a program such as this. But of course, support is not limited to the classroom. And by geographical proxy, Zach, oh, <laughs> so I said that wrong. Zach and I <laughs> have spent a fair bit of time together in the pubs and taverns of Temes Temescal? Help me. Temescal. I don't hang out in Oakland. Temescal. Uh, sometimes <laughs> talking books or talking writing or music or film but also just shooting the shit over an extra beer and decompressing after late night workshops that have ruined any chance of restful sleep for hours. <laughs> I'm very fortunate to have found a fellow writer and friend with the chops, that's a beard, and <laughs> perseverance at, that Zach displays. So please applaud our final reader this evening, our very own bullet with butterfly wings, Zach Gravis. <laughs> Um, Pat wrote an awesome intro, and then he made a Smashing Pumpkins reference, which just sent it over the top. <laughs> uh, so before I begin, some, some thank yous are in order. Firstly, I want to thank everyone in my year. Uh, more than just a talented bunch of writers, you guys are amazing friends. And you're the reason that this, these last two years have been so memorable. Um, so if you want to talk about the worth of a MFA program, for me, it's, it's you guys. So I'm grateful to all of you, even if my liver isn't. Um, I, want to, I want to thank all of the second years um, from last year. You guys set the bar, and you showed us how it was done. I want to thank my roommate, Dane, who's here. He has to put up with me day after day. And I'm actually really hard to live with because I make you watch a lot of Jean-Claude Van Damme movies. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so I want to thank all the many great instructors I've worked with during my time at CCA. Uh, Hugh Bem Steinberg, Matthew Airbarn, Steve Ajay, Al Young, Eric, Os Eric Olson, Dodi Bellamy, Gloria Frim, Anita Amirizvani, Joseph Lees, and Donna De La Perriere. I'd like to acknowledge the late Anne Marino, and I want to thank David Marini for being our resident superhero, literally. Um, I want to give special mention to John Lasky, who taught the first fiction workshop of my first semester. I think if you've worked with John, you know that he really goes that extra mile and becomes an advocate for your, for your writing. Um, I want to thank my wonderful thesis committee of Tom Barbash and Kevin Killian. And I, I literally would not be here uh, without Kevin, because it was being a fan of his work when I was just a shy kid in the Midwest that made me look into the writing program here. I think uh, a great book at the right time can be a reminder that you're, you're not as alone as you feel. And so when I was reading Kevin's books, um, it, it was that kind of reminder for me. And that's what I hope to do someday with my own writing. 
Um, so with that said, I should probably read some of my damn thesis. Um, <laughs> it's a dark comedy set around a evangelical Christian school in the Midwest, which sounds like it should write itself, and I, I kind of wish it had. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to read from the, the opening and the ending, kind of do the alpha omega. Um, so, drivers on Joy Road could be forgiven for failing to notice Sheldon Christian Academy entirely. The private institution is shielded from passing eyes, situated as it is behind the drab facade of the now defunct Calvary Baptist Church, a building which shares the school's color scheme of chalky white brick and peeling brown shingles. While the school admittedly employs some of the former personnel of the church, Sheldon Academy itself boasts no particular denomination. Founded in 1977, the institution has long prided itself on nurturing students' grades K through 12 in their spiritual walk. Principal Bowler, who was quick to remind visitors that he was a star player for the Michigan Badgers in his college days, was instrumental in developing the curriculum, which strives to, quote, fortify students in the Christian faith as they begin their perilous journey into the secular world. Taking a step past the threshold of the school, visitors are greeted by a checkered floor polished with some level of regularity by the janitorial staff, and rows and rows of beige lockers, the rough coats of paint peeling. Set above these lockers is a framed placard declaring cleanliness is next to godliness. As soon as class is let out, the Spartan hallways are transformed by the bustling horde of the student body, school bags slung over their shoulders like army knapsacks. Approach students, and you're likely to hear the difference Sheldon Christian Academy has made in their lives. This school is gay as hell, one young man declares. Why does the hallway always smell like stale bread, another asks. Some students will confess that the school's heavy workload has given them spinal issues. From lugging around oversized math and science textbooks, one such student, who has gone so far as to see a chiropractor once a week at the behest of her mother, adds, I guess that's the price you pay for college prep. I've got to get in to miss you or I'll literally kill myself, like literally. Many students at Sheldon Academy have attended the school since their elementary years. These students commonly refer to themselves as lifers. Yeah, I've been here since the third grade, confides one student named Xander. It's pretty bad when you keep hoping your dad gets laid off so he can't afford to send you to school. <laughs> On the Sheldon Christian Academy website, visitors can choose to play an eight-minute video in Windows Media Player format starring Principal Bowler himself. His mustard-colored suit strains around his massive frame as his arms gesture a welcome. By this time, his former footballer's build has gone soft from, quote, too many complimentary donuts and trips to the candy jar, according to Office Secretary Janet Van Deen. Here at Sheldon Christian Academy, Principal Bowler begins from outside the school entrance, we pride ourselves on developing not only our students' minds and bodies, but even more importantly, their walk with God. At this moment, evil-eyed viewers may notice a stray piece of trash, what looks like an empty bag of Frito snack chips, tumble across the parking lot, and strike Principal Bowler's faux leather shoes. One student, who released his name as Tim Grady, recently transferred to the academy after finishing up at Garden Hill Middle School. Sure, the academy isn't perfect, he admits from his place in the lunch line, but what school is? I asked my parents to enroll me here because I wanted to attend a school with a Christ-centric curriculum. I have to be honest, Tim continues, I was disappointed at first. I mean, we had to memorize Bible verses in order to get a grade and things like that. But I will, when I looked around, everybody seemed embarrassed that they were attending a Christian school. Nobody was on fire for God. Thankful <laughs> thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, things have changed in a big way this semester. As for what caused this dramatic reversal? Two words, Tim says. Well, I guess one word with the way Mr. Bridges spells it, Christ watch. Yes, Christ watch is the word that seems to be on the hearts and minds of the students at Sheldon Christian Academy this 2003-2004 academic year. The after school program was created by Mr. Bridges, the ninth grade Bible instructor who himself is a newcomer to the academy. Word spread fast among the more devout members of the student body leaping from locker to locker like a divine game of telephone in which the call originated from God. Mr. Bridges isn't like the other teachers here, Tim explains. He's the real deal. 
Christ Watts meet, meets every Wednesday in unused classrooms to engage in fervent prayer sessions and testimonials. Students hold hands, sing worship songs, and share the concerns utmost on their hearts. During particularly intense sessions, it is not uncommon to watch the tears stream down a student's face as they reveal that they have not yet pledged their lives to God. And it was only two months ago that the group came to the decision that while the scripture readings and prayer meets helped to nourish the students' spiritual growth in their own right, what Christ Watch really called for was an outreach program. We've got an entire town situated around this building, Mr. Bridges said at that decisive Christ Watch session. Seated on the carpeted floor, the gathered students looked up at their teacher as the setting sun filtered through the drawn blinds and cast an amber glow around his thinning hair. Have you seen what's going on out there? I'm downtown every weekend, places like the Coffee Bean and Mr. Rasta's Hookah Bar, and what I'm hearing from these kids is that they're in a world of hurt. They're on drugs, or their parents are on drugs, or else their parents are never around, or worse, only abuse them when they are around. So their grades are slipping, and they're turning to premarital sex and substance abuse in an attempt to fill the void. Mr. Bridges paused a moment to stroke the thick, bristly hairs of his goatee. Now the school board has taken the hard line that it's my duty to protect you kids from any outside influence, to shelter you from the temptations of a sinful world, Mr. Bridges said, resuming his slow pacing of the gray carpet. What I'm suggesting now what the scripture tells us is that the secular world is our mission field. Here, the teacher pivoted on his heels and aimed twin index fingers at the assembled students, and it's our duty to answer Christ's charge. Looking around the cramped classroom that afternoon, Wooden couldn't help but notice the quivering lips of the freshman members of Christ Watch. As they gazed up at Mr. Bridges with rapt attention, their adoration was projected across their faces like the twin movie screens of the nearby Wayne Drive-In Theater. So spoilers, it doesn't go well. Um, <laughs> so we pick up one year later with our main character. Robert Chaplin is sitting in his cramped apartment in the area of Ann Arbor, dubbed Carytown, surfing the web on his laptop. He's making the usual rounds, checking the recent album reviews on Tuning Fork, tracking Hollywood developments at Ain't It Spiffy News, and reading up on international affairs via the BBC when he receives an email from Tim Grady. Tim, who has kept Robert informed of the latest happenings and development at Sheldon Christian Academy since Robert's graduation in June of the previous year. Already, Roberts learned about a shocking affair between a teacher and her 15-year-old student, another student who was suspended for pantsing a classmate during gym class, and a Christwatch imitation group called the J Crew, short for the Jesus Crew, <laughs> that had flared up and then vanished in a matter of weeks like a bad rash. There even persists a rumor that Roberts' former classmate, Melanie Prescott, now a freshman at Purdue, is pregnant some expect her to announce a Russian engagement to her boyfriend, Andrew Laser, any day now. Whether or not Andrew is truly a happy father to be, the guitar player and backing vocalist has achieved some manner of success with this Christian rock band. Their first single, When I See You on That Shining Day, has received major radio, <laughs> has received major radio play across the country, though some credit this to the song's inoffensive lyrics which are ambiguous enough that they could just as easily be about a boy-girl romantic relationship as it could be about God. MTV's music blog declared the song a, quote, stirring fusion of emos, throat-curdling theatrics, and the heart-tugging earnestness of 70s singer-songwriters. <laughs> Tim's tales often give Robert the impression that the school has gone mad since his departure, as though somehow his class was the only force keeping all of that chaos at bay. But inwardly, he knows this isn't true. He knows it's far more likely that Sheldon Academy has long been home to a certain level of sordidness. And it's only now, with the vantage of distance and time, that he can look back and appraise the institution for what it really is and not what it once meant to him. Robert is encouraged to hear that Tim himself, at least, appears to be doing well. I'm trying to keep the flame alive for a new generation, Tim writes. It isn't always easy. Still, when Robert finds himself replying to Tim's emails, he often wishes he possessed the heart to tell Tim that he no longer cares much about Sheldon Academy or its idle gossip. Tonight is different. Tonight is the night he receives an email informing him that Matt Poehler is dead. Tim provides a hyperlink to the Sheldon Gazette. The article indicates that Matt was killed in a freak accident while on a hunting trip with his father in the Upper Peninsula. Robert shakes his head in disbelief as he reads, 
The article goes on to say that Matt was only 16 years old and is survived by both his parents, recently divorced, and an older brother who collectively mourn the loss of such a bright and promising young man. Services are to be held later in the week at a funeral home in Westville. Half an hour later, Robert closes his laptop, turns out the light, and settles into bed. He briefly wonders how he'll dispel the image of Matt Puller's face from his mind. But against his expectations, sleep comes quickly, and when it comes, it is a deep sleep. In his dreams, Robert sees a green tuft of grass atop a hill, a picturesque patch where a lion will lay down with a lamb at a time for now distant on the horizon in which all fear will be erased and the remainder of his life will unfurl slowly like a gold banner in a cloudless sky, his days too infinite to enumerate, too sorrowless to say. The dream is like some distant memory of childhood or a time that precedes birth, a place where his heart's unceasing doubt is enveloped by love. Thank you. So I'm way too sober, so you should all join us over at the writer's studio. <laughs>